Good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining us um, with Progenesis' webinar today. We have uh, the wonderful topic of role of female tract in the microbiome in IVF. And my name is Dr. Sheila Lee. I'm the VP of Science and Innovation with Progenesis. And this month, we are highlighting the current practices and data supporting the importance of testing of reproductive tract in microbiome and receptivity in IVF or infertility. We have an excellent panel for you today. We have Dr. William Bologna. Dr. Bologna co-founded one of the first publicly traded women's health companies in the United States and went on to develop and license market leading products in fertility and female sexual health, including Crinone. Dr. Bologna has been granted more than 50 patents covering new drug delivery systems unique pharmaceutical compositions and methods for treating women's health disorders, such as endometriosis, infertility, premature labor, dysmenorrhea, vaginal infections, among other conditions. In his capacity as chairman and chief scientific officer, Dr. Bologna supervised the company's regulatory affairs, product development, clinical development, manufacturing, and quality control. In addition, Dr. Bologna founded a medical consulting, marketing, and advertising company, Bologna International in 1980, which provided services to multinational pharmaceutical companies. Currently, Dr. Bologna serves as the chairman and chief scientific officer of Bologna Pharma Development. We're very excited to have him. Our second speaker, Dr. Jose Hercadas, earned his university degree in molecular biology and biochemistry from the University of Autonoma de Madrid in 1993 and PhD at the same university in the year 2000. He did his PhD work on virology with Dr. Margarita Salas, one of the most reputable scientists in Spain. After that, he moved to, the, to be the scientific director of the foundation um, IBI or EB Valencia until 2009. He was one of the founder and CSO of iGenomics until 2011. He moved to the university in 2011, being full assistant professor of genetics at the Pablo de Olividad University in Seville. Since 2011, he has been founder of several companies of technological base. Recombine Europe in 2011, IGLS in 2011, Sinai 2012, Blue Genomics, Full Genomics, excuse me, in 2018, Overture Life, amongst others. He has studied the molecular basis of endometrial receptivity and other aspects of reproductive medicine, publishing around 60 scientific publications, six patents, and more than 15 books and book chapters. He has worked at the University of Pablo de Olivadat, Seville, Spain, University of Munich, uh, Germany, University of Cambridge, University of Rio Grande de Sur, uh, University of Valencia, uh, University of California, and also Eastern Virginia Medical School, at least two in the United States. Along with our um, speakers, we also have our guest co-moderator with us today, Dr. Daniel Williams, who is the Medical Director of Reproductive Fertility Center. And we're very excited because he will bring his expertise in reproductive endocrinology and his experience in pa patient care to our post-presentation discussions. As uh, uh, we're about to go ahead and uh, start our presentations now, but we encourage all of our attendees to please use the Q&A session and also the chat sessions to please go ahead and post your questions there. And we will, during the uh, session post-presentation, um, address those questions to the speaker. If you'd like, uh, go ahead and include that speaker directly, or we'll go ahead and ask the panel. Very good. Let's go ahead and start our presentations. Dr. Bologna. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I'm going to speak about normalization of the general microbiome to improve implantation, specifically looking at lactobacillus cryptobacillus in the synergistic mixture with polyacrylic acid polymers. Uh, slide. A genital urinary lactobacillus dominated flora plays a pivotal role in determining fertility and in particular, lactobacillus crispitus. Lactobacillus dominate the microbial community 
and they're commonly associated with a healthy genitourinary status. Lactobacilli produce lactic acid and protect the vagina by maintaining a low pH that prohibits the growth of most pathogenic bacteria. The presence of pathogens in the genital tract, such as chlamydia, gardnerella, uroplasma, and gram-negatively stained microorganisms adversely affect fertility. A non-lactobacillus-dominated microbiome has been shown to be associated with dysbiosis. This imbalance has a negative impact on implantation rates in ART and may also be responsible for habitual abortions. A complex interaction of lactobacillus species plays a pivotal role in the equilibrium of the normal vaginal flora, and in particular, appropriate levels of lactobacillus crispitus are involved as a protective factor for asymptomatic BV, a potential impairing factor in infertility. The presence in the cervical flora of gram-negative bacteria, chlamydia, gardnerella, and the lactobacillus, lactobacillus, lactobacillus is closely linked with infertility than the inability to conceive. A slide. The uterine cavity used to be regarded as a sterile organ. However, it has its own specific microbiota, which is 100 to 1,000 times less dense than the vagina and is dominated by a greater variety of bacterial species and different strains of lactobacillus in the healthy vaginal microbiota. Bacteria in the endometrium defend the body against infection and play an important role in reproductive outcomes, such as implantation rates and ultimately in preterm birth. The presence of pathogenic bacteria, Gardnerella, Klebsiella, Neisseria, Staph, Strep, in the endometrium, together with the depletion of lactobacillus species is associated with impaired reproductive function. These data indicate that the endometrial biome should be considered as a cause of implantation failure and or pregnancy loss. Of course, most pregnancy losses are, of course, genetic. Next slide. Preterm birth is a major cause of neonatal morbidity and mortality worldwide. Increasing evidence links the vaginal microbiome to this risk of spontaneous to the risk of spontaneous premature preterm labor that leads to a course preterm birth. A meta-analysis of 17 studies that was published between 2014 and 2021 and included 38 to 539 pregnancies and 8 to 107 preterm births demonstrated women presenting with low lactobacilli with a low lactobacilli vaginal microbiome were had increased risk for delivering preterm compared to lactobacillus crispitus dominant women. The, the network meta-analysis supports the microbiome being predictive of preterm birth, and a low abundance of lactobacillus is associated with the highest risk, and lactobacillus crispitus dominance is the most important. Next slide. The importance of lactobacillus, specifically lactobacillus crispitus, is linked with, to its ability to synthesize lactic acid by anaerobic fermentation, producing the vaginal epithelial cells. Estradiol controls lactic acid production and contributes to a vaginal environment acidification in young women between the pH of 3.0 and 4.5, suitable for lactobacillus bacteria harboring and enabling them to grow and multiply and dominate in the cervical vaginal niche. In addition, lactic acid is considered a healthy vaginal microbiome marker due to its mild acidic pH chip, which makes cervical, the cervical vaginal environment unsuitable for pathogenic colonization. Next slide. Lactobacillus bacteria through lactic acid production are able to upregulate autophagy process through cyclic adenosine monophosphate inhibition, promoting pathogen bacteria clearing. In order to kill pathogenic bacteria and to prevent vaginal colonization by pathogenic species, lactobacillus crispitus 
also synthesizes hydrogen peroxide and bacteriocins, uh, proteins contributing to the, to the maintenance of a healthy genital urinary sample. Next slide, please. In order for lactobacillus to become the dominant organism in the vaginal microbiome, a vaginal acidic pH must be maintained. It is critical. It's not enough just to administer, if you will, uh, lactobacillus, but it has to be an environment in which the lactobacillus can thrive. Next slide, please. We have been working with bioadhesive systems that adhere to the vaginal epithelium for 72 hours or more, and they buffer the vaginal pH to the physiological range, meaning under 4.5, no matter where the um, pH starts. Uh, polycarbophil is one of the, the polymers that we have used, and it is a very large polymer, and therefore you can't grow antibodies to it. It is non-immunogenic, so safe to use. It is an ingredient, for example, in crinone, which is approved for use in virtually every country in the world for women through the entire first trimester of pregnancy. Next slide, please. The effect of the polycarbophil is acidic. It has a pKa of 4.2 and an almost limitless buffering capacity because of a very large number of functional carboxyl groups. Vaginally, this creates an acidic pH no matter the starting point. Even in women who are taking antiestrogens such as tamoxifen and have entered studies with a mean pH of 7, Polycarbo restored the pH to the physiologic range of 4 to 4.5. Bioadhesion is the result of hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonds are weak bonds, but in the case of a large polymer, they're numerous and therefore tenacious, and they stay in place until the cells turn over, which can be as long as three to seven days. Next slide, please. This is a study that we conducted uh, on the duration of the bioadhesive effect of polycarbophil, specifically looking at pH. These women were postmenopausal and began with a pH above 6.0. Within the single dose, immediately the pH came down to the near physiologic range, and it remained in that range for almost a week. Next slide, please. This is a study of women with breast cancer who were taking tamoxifen, and as you can see, these women we were able to bring their pH down to a physiologic range under 4.5 and, 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 and maintain it there indefinitely. Next slide, please. This was a study done in, uh, in Italy where a polycarbophil-based uh, gel, a 2% gel, was compared with a vaginal douche used twice weekly. What the study demonstrated as in other studies, that the pH would come down below 4.5, no matter where it started. In this case, the pH started at uh, about 5.5. That wasn't the case for, for, for douching. The next slide. The women in this that study all were diagnosed with uh, BV, with bacterial vaginosis. And as you can see from the slide, the pH came down under 4.5 clue cells they disappeared in all but one woman. And importantly, the odor went away immediately and stayed away. And that's just a simple um, chemical phenomenon. Uh, the amines that cause the unpleasant odor in bacterial vaginosis can only volatize in a pH of 4.7 or above. So if you bring the pH down, the amines can volatilize and the odor goes away immediately. Uh, as you can see with the vaginal douche, there, none of, it was, there was no real reduction in pH or elimination of odor or the clinical cells remain. Next slide. The way in which this works is what is known as the, in chemistry as the Donnan equilibrium. Polycarbonate is a very large molecule it adheres to the uh, cell surface. So there are negative charges all along the cell surface. And in that process, an equilibrium has to be created. 
The negative charges have to be balanced, of course, with positive charges. The negative charges are on the surface, but the positive charges to balance that charges are intracellular. Uh, next slide. Cations, specifically uh, uh, sodium and potassium, move in to balance the negative charge on the surface. Water follows and the epithelium becomes plump. The cells appear plump rather than atrophic, and you, there is no change in the maturation index. You can't tell the difference between uh, local estrogen and using a, 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 a polyacrylic acid polymer to plump up the cells. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. Oh. Hello? Have I lost? Hello? Hi, yeah, you, uh, Hello? looks like the slides did not load onto us. Oh, well, don't worry, I can speak over it. No Just worries. leave that slide up and I'll finish you off with that. Leave the last slide up and I'll, I'll, I'll finish you off with that. Uh, okay. okay. Um, the, uh, the purpose of this is we have worked to show that we can deliver lactobacillus and specifically lactobacillus crispitus to the vagina. But in order for the bacteria, the lactobacillus to grow and to thrive, the environment has to be acidic. And that's what we're using the, the polymers for. In nature, that process is um, dealt with with estradiol normally. But obviously in women who have infections, the estradiol based system is insufficient. So we are in a sense artificially creating a physiologic platform from which we can deliver the organisms and presumably have an impact upon implantation rates, upon early pregnancy loss, and ultimately, this is something to be seen in future research. If we start off with a healthy microbiome in the vagina, the uh, cervix, and the endometrium, one has to believe that it will probably have a, a positive impact in preventing preterm labor. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bologna. All right, if we can go ahead and have Dr. Herculada's slides, then we can go ahead and have them present for you. Can you put the first slide, please? Okay, it's a uh, start before, but it's okay, the previous one. Uh, well, we thank you very much for inviting me to to this webinar, and uh, well, we mainly uh, have been working, as you mentioned before, in endometrial receptivity in endometrium, and in this uh, scenario, there are mainly two uh, positions, two 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 ways to see the 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 embryonic implantation. There are two main actors: it's the embryo and the endometrium at a receptive status. So mainly in the years before I started to work in endometrium, all everything was focused on the on the on the on the patients, on the ovary, on the gametes, on the mainly in the embryo. But uh, the endometrium was like a black box, and uh, this is one of the reasons because I we we started to work with uh, the gene expression and the uh, histological also, and also the microbiome of, of the endometrium to know more about this tissue. Can go on, please. Next slide. So this is because we don't consider uh, the metronome as secondary active. Go. 
Go next, please. So what is important for successful embryo implantation for a pregnancy? So selecting the best embryos, improve the endometrial receptivity in a stimulated cycle at the beginning, because now many uh, transfers are, are, are performed with uh, frozen embryos, and also to know the cause the causes of infertility of endometrial origin. And this is one of the reasons of, of our research. Go on, please. Okay. So go ahead. So mainly the, the endometrial tissue is an uh, incredible and magical tissue that is regenerated every single month for being functional and useful only for a uh, few times in the life. And during these changes uh, due to the stradiol and progesterone mainly, uh, there are many changes that happen at tissue level, cellular level, and at the end, uh, molecular level. And these uh, changes uh, has clinical interest. Go ahead, please. Oof, everything is changing. Okay. Uh, after the peak of LH, that is uh, with the ovulation, uh, there is the stradiol and progesterone. This is the, the slide, but it's not working. Now go ahead. If not, I can put my presentation. Yes. Do you want to go ahead and put your presentation? Uh, if if everything is like this, yes. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. It looks like this. Okay. Nate, while we're waiting for Dr. Jose to bring his presentation up, um, I thank uh, Dr. Bologna for his presentation and, you know, really have learned some interesting topics, especially with, you know, my years in uh, reproductive, uh, in the reproductive field. I know that um, endometrial and reproductive tract screening uh, decisions are not quite made with direct testing. So it's uh, we would love to ask some questions as follow-up. Perfect, I see your presentation's uploaded, so we'll save our questions till the end. Okay, <clears throat> can you see my, my screen? Okay, perfect, this is better, much better. Okay, so this is the slide that you couldn't see, uh, but we know everything, I mean, everybody knows about the endometrial um, physiology. So we focus on our research mainly in LH plus seven, seven days after the peak of endogenous LH. And this is in there around 2021 20, of the menstrual cycle. So for many years, uh, it was studied by morphological markers, biochemical markers, but at the end, the gene expression pattern is who is driving the morphological and biochemical markers. The morphological markers like pinopulse, at the end, they didn't were related directly with uh, fertility or infertility, and also the histological markers that were published many years ago, 75 years ago, by Noyes, and this, so they didn't uh, were useful in the clinic. At the end, there were many, many papers uh, showing the pitfalls of the endometrial evaluation by the histological markers. Inter-server inter inter and cyclo cycle cycle variation. And at the end, the ASRM said that histological dating is not the definitive method for the diagnosis of luteal phase deficiency or to guide clinical management in infertility. Also, the biochemical markers in blood, some of them like TGF beta or other like CSF1, they showed a profile of, uh, of, of receptivity because they were up during the day 2021 of the menstrual cycle, but they were not related directly with fertility and infertility. So there are many studies at the histological level, ultrasound, secretome, microbiome, transcriptome, uh, performed during many years uh, trying to find markers or useful tools to be used in the clinic. And at the end, with the genome, in the genomics era, the, the, the uh, technology, the microarray, the NGS, uh, allow us to know more about the physiology of the endometrium, uh, showing the gene expression of the as a markers of endometrial receptivity. Focus always on LH plus seven. So one of the most important paper I published was in 2008, in which we uh, we 
dissect day by day from day one, day one to day day nine out in the literal phase, uh, every every single gene that were, was upregulated or downregulated during this change from pre-receptive to receptive. And uh, with this information and also information of other uh, authors showing the gene expression profile of the implantation of failure or endometriosis and many papers published before, we could develop some endometrial tools and endometrial tests to be used in the, in the clinic. This is part of the paper that I were published, more than 7,000 papers uh, talking about the gene expression of the endometrium in cancer, endometriosis, myomas, stimulated cycle, implantation failure, contraception, and obesity. I had the opportunity to, to publish in every single one, except in, in cancer. So at the end, uh, the, the embryo selection is done, uh, as you know, by morphological, morphological characteristic, uh, by PET, by non-invasive PET, now by metabolomics, by morphodynamic, ETC, but at the end, we don't have more than 70% of pregnancy, even selecting the best embryo. It means that we have, a, we can improve this percentage of pregnancy if we are able to detect problems in endometrium. So we did this idea, the first uh, um, publication, the first development was uh, the ERA test that I, I did in uh, working in EBI in 2011. But in fact, this is not the first paper. One year before, uh, a Chinese group, they published an, a gene expression microarray to analyze the endometrium, but it was not a, a, a paper so known that this one, because this one was immediately used in the clinic. Using this test, there are many papers uh, with a small number of, of patients that they talk about the uh, repeated implantation failure, endometriosis, and many, many, many papers. Most of them talking that this uh, tool is useful in clinic. In 2020, the five years multicenter uh, randomized control trial uh, published by Carlos Simon show uh, uh, a number of an increase in the pregnancy rate, implantation rate, accumulative leave birth rate uh, per, uh, in, the, in the personalized embryo transfer compared to, to the control group. However, this paper was uh, very controversial because it has 50% of dropout patients. And uh, very soon, other publication start to talk about uh, this test or uh, this kind of test was not proven. And in 2021, the group of uh, Shelly Group Fertility Center published this. This is the abstract in ASRM and later the paper in which they use uh, this test to personalize embryo transfer to all the patients in the clinic, showing that the uh, error did not improve the uh, ongoing pregnancy. Other papers also published by the same group of Phoebe show the similar results and uh, showing that the ERA test was not useful. But uh, in 2018, another type of uh, tools uh, similar to ERA were developed using a similar approach with non-receptive, pre-receptive, receptive samples. And this is a work I did in 2018 and I published um, with almost 200 genes at the beginning that were upregulated or downregulated, always comparing LH plus seven receptive versus LH plus two pre-receptive, showing that these genes really, they were, uh, they were changing in the women during the development of the receptivity status. So of those genes, some of them, they really were very good biomarkers because they, always were up or down regulated in all the women. So we could uh, take only 16, with 16 genes, we could uh, classify all the samples, 95% um, of the sample. And with all 40 genes, only 40 genes, four zero, we could classify all the samples. So what it means? It means that there are many tests in the market um, that has been developed. And I used to say that all of them are useful and all, all the roads lead Rome, but perhaps there are some roads better than others or simply it's not the road, but the way to face the road. It means how to use the test. 
In fact, there are other papers published in 2021 and 22, in which they demonstrate that using other similar tests than the, the, the same test that I developed, uh, they increase the pregnancy rate clearly. Even very independent group, like this group from Japan, that they published that uh, that the, this, these tests were useful for the for to to use in the in the clinic, which is the difference with the previous the previous publications, mainly because they select and they use alternative diagnostic tool for poor prognostic patients and not for all of the patients, and this is one of the main reasons. What this is clear is that the pharmacogenomics of the progesterone and also the stradiol is affecting the endometrium in a different way. Here you can see for almost 200 patients how uh, in green, some of them are developing the endometrial receptivity at the time of embryo transfer, but some of them are delayed and some of them are in advance. Here in, in progesterone 5.5, you can see how a group of patients is post-receptive and a group of patients is pre-receptive. So I can assure you that if you transfer a very, very good embryo in a post-receptive endometrium, you are not going to have an implantation and a, and a pregnancy. So this is the main reason because some of the patients should be subjected to this, to this test. It also shows that the endometrial receptivity is how the window of implantation is a window that open very slow but close very fast. So this is the reason to use this test in some of the patients. In our hands, um, using the, the, the test that is currently offered in the US, we see that uh, almost 75% of the women are receptive at the time of, of, of transfer, so they five of 5.5, but that group of, uh, some group of patients are pre-receptive, post-receptive, or even non-receptive. So this is the reason to do uh, the test to personalize embryo transfer for these women that they have a delay on an advanced endometrium at the time of embryo transfer. So the idea that we had at the beginning is that, that we are carrying uh, the embryos a lot. We are looking at the genetics. We are doing the best with them, but we need to determine also the best time for embryo transfer because they deserve the best endometrial environment. As uh, Dr. Bologna mentioned before, not everything, of course, is endometrial receptivity. There are other factors that are affecting the endometrial receptivity or the pregnancy success. And this is one of the publications talking about recurring implantation failure. The microbiome, we believe that it was sterile and it's not. It's very important, as you have seen before. And this is because we have added this information to the endometrial test. Which is what we believe at the beginning that the endometrial implantation was completely sterile and is not. There are many, many uh, bacteria and many other microorganisms that are in, uh, living with, uh, with our cells. So at the end, the composition of the vaginal uterine micro micro microbiome uh, that we call endometrial microbiome is very important and the dysbiosis is associated with endometritis and inflammatory status of the endometrium. So endometritis is also found to be 40% of infertility cases and also we is involved in repeated implantation failure. This is one of the publications that which you can see how, as also Dr. Bologna mentioned before, that when you have a lactoacillus a, a dominant microbiome, you have much better uh, pregnancy rates, implantation rate, ongoing pregnancy rate, and of course, decrease the miscarriage rates compared to those endometrium in which the lactobacillus is not dominant. And also, as he mentioned before, and this is very important, is not only to have a percentage of lactobacillus over 90%, 80%, but also which kind of lactobacillus is involved, is present in endometrium. And this is because, as he mentioned, the presence or the production of H2O2 or the acid, uh, lactic acid. So this is because now, since uh, three years ago, we uh, analyze also this information. We analyze also the, the, the population of, of bacteria that are in the, in the endometrium to check if the, uh, the normal 
uh, population of the microbiome is good or not compared to patients that, have, that they have uh, dysbiosis. And also because it's not only dysbiosis, it's also uh, pathogens. So here you have a, a, a different, very, very, very big difference about how to do the analysis. Here you can see if you analyze by NGS using ribosomal RNA, and here are the data published by another group in which they have these results. But here you can see how the low biomass, 27%, it's a lot because they are analyzing also, uh, they, can, they can analyze also uh, uh, alive or death uh, populations of bacteria. But using a quantity PCR, this is our own data, in which not only we can detect, we don't have no biomass in any sample, but also because we can detect the presence of fungi, virus, and other pathogens, so it changes a lot the treatment of the patients. But also the immunology, and this is uh, the only slide I have for immunology, in which in some cases, the unbalance of the immunological uh, environment in endometrium is important, so we, we can measure also the NK uh, that are uh, 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 cytotoxic or that are related with the vascularization. Finally, to say that if we do or we perform this type of test is because we can do a treatment. If we have problems with endometrial receptivity due to the delay or advanced endometrium, we can change the day of the embryo transfer, or if we have a low endometrial receptivity, we can also apply a treatment that already are uh, empiric, but some of them are working with some woman. With the endometrial microbiome, mainly the use of prebiotics and probiotics, and in the case of, of pathogens, the use of antibiotics. We have a, now we have submitted a paper, a, an abstract, sorry, in which we can see how implantation, patients with implantation failure, after treatment, they get almost 50% of pregnancy after, after this treatment. And with endometrial immunology, also the, the use of, of anticoagulants or immunoglobulins. Finally, to say, as I mentioned before, that uh, I don't believe, never I believe that this is a test to use for every single patient coming to the IVF clinic. There is a, a group of patients that they can benefit of, of this test, implantation failure, miscarriage, one MB available, adenomyosis, obesity, and um, in many cases, a thin endometrium, because a thin endometrium, if you have a good endometrial receptivity, probably you are going to have a, a good uh, re result. And I want to insist also in the sample type that it's very important the quality of the sample at the time to analyze in the laboratory. But with the reading that we provide in, uh, in our lab, uh, this uh, the RNA that we analyze is very stable. I want to conclude saying that the endometrium doesn't reach the endometrial receptivity status at the same time in all women, that the invasive endometrial test by gene expression analysis can detect changes in endometrial tissue related with endometrial function, that this analysis should be recommended in a selected group of patients, that the endometrial microbiome is also involved in endometrial physiology, and also something not related with the, with the science, but with the medical practice, that is a good coordination between patient medication and clinical intervention is also crucial to have good clinical outcome. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much to our speakers. Those were excellent presentations. Um, and now I'd like to invite Dr. Dan Williams to um, discuss any of the audience questions. And we, at this point, uh, we encourage our audience members, if you haven't done so already, to please go ahead and post any questions that you may have for our speakers while we have them on the panel. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lee. First, I wanna thank our speakers. Uh, clearly they are, uh, giants in the field and their research is, is fantastic. Obviously, these are complex issues that have gone on for decades, obviously since the 80s. So uh, we have a lot of work to do and, and certainly we're making strides, but still have some ways to go. So there is an audience question and that is uh, for both speakers, how can the microbiome of the vagina affect the microbiome of 
the uterus? What is the route or mechanism of action? Uh, it is, uh, there has not been definitive studies. Let me start by saying that. But it would appear that the, the uterine microbiome clearly affects the 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 uh, I'm sorry the, the the vaginal microbiome clearly uh, affects the cervical microbiome. There have been studies done. Uh, there was a study done in uh, Paris by uh, Renato Fanchon and um, uh, Rene Friedman, where they use a, a, an embryo catheter and they took samples, and you could see the dramatic difference between the women who had pathology and the women who had a normal microbiome in, in the cervix. Uh, and that's only, that's not because of the cervix, that's because the same bacteria presumably exist, the pathological bacteria existed in the endometrium. So the presumptive mechanism is vagina, cervix, uterus. Uh, although, you know, I, let me let me let me just say that no one has done a definitive study to show at any you know from the same point in time that all the microbiomes are the same. Exactly, I want to add absolutely. I mean, absolutely agree that uh, we are we are doing this uh, type of analysis. We are now correlating the the presence of and mainly how uh, Doctor Bologna said mainly the pathogenic bacteria and the express the gene expression of what we analyze in the vagina and with the uterus and the correlation in between. And it's a, it is a correlation. And in fact, we are advancing a lot in the in the vagina because at the end it's easier to do the analysis than not taking an endometrial biopsy and also to taking the the a, a piece of a sample from the vagina. Yes. Thank you. Like part of the, of the future is there. So, so I have another question. This is uh, to Dr. Horkatis, but also to Dr. Bologna. So particularly in light of the recent studies regarding ERA, uh, which generally indicate it's really not possibly useful, or if it is, it's used in a selective or empiric manner. How does your test differ on the receptivity side, you indicated how it differed on the microbiome evaluation side, but I was curious as to how your test would differ from the ERA as a receptivity window assay. Well, you know, when I did the ERA test in 2009, obviously 2011, we used uh, the data from one only microarray. At that time, not only the only the 30% of the genes were present in the, in the microarray, but this is what the, the tool we had at that time. So when I did the second test in 2017, and you know, in in a few years we had the whole genome in microarrays, but we did the NGS also. So mainly we had new uh, molecule, new genes that were involved in in the vascularization, inflammation, and disease that were not present in the in the era test, but. Really, believe me that I don't think that the one test is better than the other at the time of endometrial receptivity because we did the validation with more than 150 samples and only one difference in between. The one was in a receptive and the other was post-receptive, but the rest were the same result. But if you combine with the microbiome, that this is, of course, much evolutionated than the other because we do the 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 digital PCR and we, we analyze the pathogenic, the whole analysis is much, much better in terms that they produce uh, more information about the endometrium. And just a quick follow-up, uh, does your um, assay also include um, chronic endometritis in terms of uh, particularly CD138 cells, et cetera, which is another um, factor, I think. Well, this is one of the things that we analyze. We not only do digital PCR, we do also ELISA for some of these uh, these molecules. Yes, not well, only the I, I Dr. just Dr. said in the, in the presentation. Yeah. A good questions for you, uh, Jose. Um, so one of the criticism we hear when it comes to uh, analyzing gene expression for receptivity is that gene expression um, changes 
from a cycle to a cycle depends on the medication, the uh, you know patient conditions, stress, etc. How can how do you take into account those physiolo physiological changes that happens in the patients when you're looking at predicting uh, endometrial receptivity? It's a very good question. I mean, I some people that say they say it's not changing. Of course, it's changing. I don't think uh, we did a, with the year test many years ago. We did a cycle to cycle, in a, the next cycle, and we didn't have any differences. Think, uh, Nabil, that uh, at the end, mainly it's a frozen embryo transfer, so mainly it's a substitute cycle, not not a, a, they are not natural cycle. So at the end, uh, what is important is the action of progesterone. And the action of progesterone at the end is a drug. So from one month to the other, uh, I assume and I, I'm sure that the, the, there are no changes. Of course, if you are uh, coming uh, six or seven months later, could be because you know, the action of progesterone is down, is, is, is drive by the progesterone receptor. And also the number of progesterone receptors change, but not from one month to the next. In fact, uh, it was published a few days ago uh, one publication would they say that they, you know, there are many, many clinicians that they measure the progesterone in blood uh, two days before the embryo transfer to correct the, the concentration. But in fact, the concentration in blood is not always correlated with the progesterone in the tissue, but is in fact the more, most important thing. So progesterone, progesterone receptor, and endometrial function in one month to the next, I don't think, I don't think, no, I know it's not changing. But I cannot say that in three, four months, it's going to change. Other people say, yes, I don't think, I don't know. So I've got three questions, I think. Uh, and Dr. Bologna, did you have anything to add to that? No, I was just, there, there has been some research that I've seen recently that uh, in endometriosis patients, at least, there is a shift in uh, progesterone receptor from receptor B to receptor A, which may uh, create some difficulty in implantation. Thank you. So I have some questions from the audience. So here's, uh, there's three of them. One is I'm preparing for an IVF transfer. My doctor suggested using Vagibloom probiotics. Do you have any suggestions on proactive approaches or products such as that leading up to a transfer? That's for either speaker. <laughs> it's, it's a good idea. I mean, obviously, there haven't been uh, enough definitive studies, but it is always a good idea to keep the um, microbiome healthy, particularly uh, as we, we, we both discussed. Um, it, is specifically uh, it is specifically Lactobacillus crispitus that you want to dominate in the flora. If the flora is, uh, for example, dominated by lactobacillus inners, it, the inners is not pathogenic, but it is also not protective. Only the crispitus is protective because it produces the lactic acid and the hydrogen peroxide. And when would you start it uh, prior to the transfer? A month before. Thank you. At least. Because you want, you want to give it time to become the dominant member of the flora. And if it is a, a vagina to cervix to endometrial transfer, then you want to give it time to, to, to occur. Thank you. Yes, I think also that they, I mean, I know many, many uh, women that they, even if they are not going to be pregnant, if they are not under treatment, they care the, the endometrial microbiome as they care the intestinal microbiome. At the end, it's part of our health. So it's not necessary to go to the clinic to, to do this, but always, why not? This is... Right. At the end, you care your skin, you care everything, but why not to care uh, millions of, of bacteria that are living with you and giving uh, a lot to the, to the endometrium or the intestine? So. So just as a follow-up to that, I know the question was uh, related to probiotics, but uh, normally, I guess there was not an indication, at least in the question, whether the patient was uh, recommended the probiotics due to a particular assay result, like a microbiome test result versus empirically. What are your recommendations um, to our speakers? What are your recommendations in cases where 
clinics are not offering a microbiome assay. Dr. Uh, I, I think every woman uh, should, to the extent possible, try to create a healthy microbiome. There is certainly no harm in a healthy microbiome. The, the other problem is that pathogenic bacteria like uh, 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 you know, BV can be asymptomatic. And so you would like to eliminate that if it's possible. Uh, so there is certainly no harm in using a probiotic. But again, specifically, you want specifically lactobacillus crispitus. This, the other lactobacillus, while I'm not harmful, also don't have the beneficial effect. Yeah. One of the problems we 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 meet all the time, uh, Sheila, is that the um, in not in all the places are available uh, the same things, and so there is not a standardized treatment, and uh, and this is something that is if you go to Colombia, Mexico, or even in Spain. And you cannot find the same products or the same things to to treat uh, people. So this is something I think we have to learn now: how to do and how to standardize uh, a treatment to to improve the the microbiome. I'm glad you said that because that is obviously exactly what we're working on in terms of using crispitus and putting it in a, an acid environment, a guaranteed acid environment, so that it can thrive. Uh, mm -hmm. But that, that that's, yeah. that's the basis of our, our research. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to get to a few other questions at this. Yeah, I would like just okay. to a quick follow up on the same sure. questions, if you don't mind. Yes. So course. you, Dr. Bolonia, you have drawn this correlation between lactobacillus and pH and how pH is important for embryo implantation and further growth. Um, but in the laboratory, the pH is neutral. Uh, when it comes to fertilization, oh. but in, and in natural fertilization, natural conception, it's a different pH. So, so how do you? Oh, yeah. Uh, when we talk about pH, we're only talking about the vagina, because the, the, it is the vagina that is the reservoir of the microbiome, and the microbiome thrives in a pH in young women between three and 4.5. The micro, the, the, the pH when you get the endometrium is completely different, but it isn't a question of the, the, the pH in, in, in the endometrium. It's a question of how do you keep pathogenic bacteria out of the endometrium? Yes. And you keep the, the presumption is you keep it out of the, the endometrium by making sure that you normalize the vaginal microbiome so that the vaginal microbiome is normalized, the cervical microbiome is presumably normalized, and presumably at least, and hopefully we'll, we'll show that, that that results in a healthy endometrial microbiome. Thank you. I think we have three questions from the audience. I don't wanna not get to those because they've been waiting. So uh, the next question is uh, basically, uh, there's a patient who had an ERA, had a successful pregnancy, and uh, now wishes to do another embryo transfer. So the question uh, to the speakers is, should the ERA be repeated or should they use the same timing? You're the expert, so I'll leave, I'll leave this to you. <laughs> um, I, I think there are many other factors, not only the a good or bad results in the, in the ER test and the and as we see in the microbiome. So um, if you have a good endometrial receptivity and you don't have, or you are um, so you're thinking that you have a problem in the endometrium, there are other factors that you can start. Well, so I think the, oh, I, I, did, I didn't repeat, uh, uh, I wouldn't repeat uh, the ERA test. Right, so in other words, a successful outcome, you would go with the same timing. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for both speakers. Is there a microbiotic recommended and commercially available for use prior and with embryo transfer? No. No, no one has. There, at least to, to my knowledge, there are um, several groups. Ours is one of them, but there's a group in Canada 
that is working on a specific uh, product uh, with a genetically modified uh, lactobacillus crispitus uh, specifically for this purpose. But uh, there's no product on the market that I'm aware of that's been tested and, and one could, you know, hand on your heart, say this one is, you know, we have the clinical data. That's not, it just uh, hasn't happened yet. It will. You will. Uh, the, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, it will. I mean, this is something that I, I said before, it has to be standardized and to, to, to demonstrate by the scientific data that they really, what they are doing or what we can do is really effective in, in one way. And uh, after to standardize the treatment. There's another question. What's the clinical directive when a virus is detected in the endometrial microbiome? This this is a medical question, Dr. Bologna. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm actually I'm a scientist. I'm not a, I'm not a medical doctor. Okay, <laughs> I don't know. In fact, uh, what uh, they recommend, but in, in fact, this is a very clinical question to to be answered by a doctor because it's I don't know, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I don't think it depends on also what you find. Um, I mean, it's, it's unusual also. Yes. It, it's more useful. It's than unusual, yeah. but in our hands, in our laboratory, uh, what is useful to, to find candida, okay? So candida and other pathogens, are they have a, a specific treatment. But I don't know with virus. What are your thoughts, Dr. Williams? You are a medical doctor. What would you... That is that is correct, I am. So, so I actually... Um, I was going to ask them what viruses they're testing for because I'm not familiar with vi the viruses we look for are going to be bloodborne, right? Um, and, and in particular, um, sexually transmitted diseases in the serum, not in uh, the endometrium. So I'm not aware clinically of that being um, a factor. And then there is another question. Um, it's basically from uh, uh, Dr. Badoshi, I think, from São Paulo, Brazil, and wants to know, uh, he wanted to congratulate uh, you both on a great lecture, and he wanted to know if there was any influence on progesterone levels uh, on uh, endometrial receptivity window, uh, whether it's 15, 20, 50 um, nanograms per mil. Uh, question? Yes, Um as was mentioned before, I invented Cridone, where you have no serum levels, essentially, where women become pregnant with serum levels below six nanograms per mil because the progesterone is driven directly from the vagina through the cervix and into the endometrium. Uh, and even in, we did open donation patients, uh, we had women who were not only pregnant with under six nanograms per mil, but maintained the pregnancy for 12 weeks with serum levels as low as uh, three or four nanograms per mil. So the serum levels um, are not the critical issue. The critical issue is the endometrial levels. Okay. Uh, and if you're using, uh, obviously, if you're using injectable progesterone, you get very high serum levels. But if you're using a vaginal progesterone like crinone, uh, you have subphysiologic levels uh, even self-physiologic for the luteal phase, never mind for eight or 10 weeks of pregnancy when there's a you know, luteal placental shift. Uh, so so it, it, it's the, the, the serum level thing is, is really hard to deal with, depends on what, uh, what form of progesterone you're using. High levels with uh, intramuscular and very, very low level, self-physiologic levels with vaginal. Yeah, the the biological cascade that is coming from the, I mean, in the case of intramuscular to to the uterus to the endometrial, is there are many many molecules involved in this in this cascade. So we in our lab we have analyzed with endometrial uh, tissue receptive, non receptive, pre receptive, post receptive, and we have analyzed the concentration of progesterone in the tissue inside the tissue, and uh, <clears throat> we have seen how. Increase from over 150, it's starting the, the, the receptive status, and over I think it's 250 or 30, you are post receptive. But it's inside the tissue. And this is also because I, I'm working with one group that they develop um, intrauterus progesterone because it's going to be delivered 
in the same uh, in the same constantly uh, during the all this uh, Luther phase to to exactly to deliver the progesterone in the place to, the, where you need. So the vagina at the end is the most uh, close place, but it's not inside the uterus. So this is because I think this type of approach are going to be success. I also have, uh, you know, one other question. I know we didn't talk very much about um, immunology in this session, but there are treatments, you know, at least that I am aware of as far as medicated FET or programmed FETs where sometimes uh, physicians choose to pre uh, prescribe anti-inflammatories. Now, if you think about interaction of drugs and we're looking at progesterone's interaction as well, do you believe that there could potentially be a negative impact um, on pregnancy outcome with the introduction of anti-inflammatories empirically? Uh, <laughs> empirical is always difficult because you, you preclude having uh, well-controlled studies. So it's hard to, to, to give a definitive answer to that. Um, although it, it would seem that an anti-inflammatory logically would not be harmful. Yeah. But that's logical. That's not uh, that's not scientific proof. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions, Dr. Williams? I think I just have one follow-up. So obviously what I've gleaned from this is that we clearly need to have some additional randomized clinical trials uh, sponsored, of course, by pharma to answer these burning questions. <laughs> we look, you're we look at to you, me. Dr. Bologna. <laughs> <laughs> uh, excuse me? Oh, I was saying we look to you for that sponsorship. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we're a poor, small company struggling but we're, we're getting that. Absolutely. No, um, all jokes aside, I agree. There should be a very clear definition as far as which patients are candidates or good candidates for testing, such as the one that ones that we recommended or the ones that we were discussing that the tests recommend. Um, and also, you know, the standardization of protocols just worldwide is extremely important. So that way we can act uh, we can identify these patients and, if needed, prescribe or um, recommend these assays to follow up. Um, so thank you. With that, I'd like to thank our speakers for their time tonight. Dr. Hercadas is in Spain, and it's uh, after midnight for him there. So we certainly appreciate the dedication. Yeah, 1 a.m. Yes, we appreciate That's the dedication. Thank you for that. And um, also we thank Dr. Dan Williams for his time and his uh, contribution as a co-moderator during this session. And it really helped with the interaction. Um, very thankful for that. And then we have Dr. Nabila Thank you. Thank you.